The final category of questions is called critical reasoning. And these questions involve areas in which you're asked to evaluate the writer's assumptions, whether or not the writer is using opinions versus facts, how objective the writer is being, and the quality of the evidence that the author is using. There are four or five key questions that we'll go over. So the first of them goes like this. Which of the following assumptions is most important to the author's argument? So you can tell from this question, there's a few things you need to figure out. The first is what the author's argument is. Without that, you wouldn't know what assumptions were important. So that's the first thing you wanna think about. Think about the writer's conclusion, what point the writer is trying to make. And that will help you to evaluate the assumption. When you look at the four assumptions, think about which one of those four actually matters, which one of them is relevant to the argument that the writer is making. You want to avoid choices that while they may be true about the world in general, they don't connect with the author's thesis or main message. So you want to avoid those. Generally, you'll be able to find that only one of them is actually relevant to the point that the author is making. Well, let's take a look at an example. So here we go. Here's the question number 23, which of the following assumptions, these four, most influence the author's argument in the passage? So let me just give you, we've looked at this before. This is uh, a passage about population decline and it principally describes the problems that the country of Japan has had since its population has been declining and the efforts that they have made to increase their population. So it identifies the problem and it identifies the things they've tried to do to fix the problem. So when we get down to question number 23, here are four, four choices. Let's think about which of those, which of these is relevant to that thesis. Elderly people will be most adversely affected by population decline. Well, th again, this may be true, maybe not true, but it's not really fundamental to the argument. It's really one of the results of population decline. B, population decline is not necessarily beneficial. Right, that's the thesis. Population decline actually can be a bad thing. So that's consistent with the thesis that the writer is making. C, efforts to promote population growth are unlikely to be successful everywhere. May be true, but not relevant to the thesis that population decline can be a problem. D, global resources can support high levels of population growth. You could have a debate about that, but this point is not actually even discussed in the article. So it's clear that B would be the best answer because it's an assumption that relates to the actual argument, whereas A, C, and D aren't. Okay, let's go to <clears throat> the next item. Which of the following statements from the selection expresses an opinion rather than a fact? <clears throat> so for many people, this is apparent just on the face of it, the difference between an opinion and a fact. 
you can look at the, the list of choices, the four, and sometimes two or three will clearly stand out as facts rather than assumptions. That's the first thing to try. The other thing you wanna think about is what evidence does the author provide? And if you look at a particular item and you can find really no evidence that the author has provided, then that is likely to be a good candidate for something being an opinion. Also look for language like none, all, always, never, much, words like that. They are often statements of opinion rather than fact. And finally, the conclusion, the concluding paragraph that the author comes to is in fact his or her opinion rather than a fact. So if the conclusion is one of the statements, you might choose that as being the opinion. Again, let's look at an example. Okay, here it is. Which of the following statements from the passage expresses an opinion rather than stating a fact? This is an article about Nellie Bly, a female journalist uh, in the mid-1900s who became famous as, as an investigative reporter, it tells the story of the kinds of stories that she researched and produced uh, during her professional career. Okay, let's look at this question. Which of these is an opinion rather than a fact? Okay, A, and the late 19th century was a time when much needed to be reformed. Okay, notice the word much here. That is a qualitative adjective, much, all. So it asserts that there were a lot of things that needed to be reformed. And if you looked at this article, you would find that the writer doesn't actually list a whole lot of specific reforms that were required. So this is an example of a statement that's not backed up by much evidence. And so it's a candidate for being an opinion. B, on one occasion, she posed as a maid for a story on employment agencies that took advantage of poor and educated women. This is a fact, right? This is reported in the article. This is something that actually happened. C, not all Bly's stories advanced this crusade against injustice and corruption. Again, here, um, the writer actually describes a, at least one story that was not advancing the crusade against injustice. So that supports this as a fact. Nevertheless, championing the cause of poor working women was a prominent theme in Bly's reporting. And yes, in the article, the author gives several examples of championing the cause of the poor, which supports this as being a fact. So we come back to A, which is the one thing out of these four that doesn't have a lot of evidence behind it. So that's the least likely to be an actual fact. And you would choose that as being an opinion. Let's go to the next type of question. Which of the following statements provides the best evaluation of the writer's objectivity? So this is a question about your assessment of whether or not the writer is being fair in his or her presentation of the material or unfair or biased. You wanna be familiar with these terms, credible, objective, and unbiased. All of these point to the author being a fair presenter of the information. That they're believable, they're following the facts, and they're not favoring one side over the other. And here's the opposite, incredible, subjective, and bias would be the negatives of each of those terms. 
Now, what you're looking for is which of the four answers actually states, in effect, that the author is being fair, because all of these articles that you'll read are written to be objective accounts. They're like textbook um, passages. So that's what you want to look for. Let's check out an example. Question number five, which of the following statements provides the best evaluation of the author's objectivity in the passage? This is the article about Ibn Battuta, the man who took those uh, journeys in the 1300s. So here are the four choices. What we're looking for is the one that asserts that the writer is being fundamentally fair, objective, and credible. A, the excessive amount of space devoted to Ibn Battuta's travels in Asia raises questions of authorial bias. So this is a criticism, right? The writer's being excessive and biased. So that's negative, probably not the right answer. B, the author provides a straightforward, unbiased account of Ibn Battuta's travels and writings. This is positive, okay? Straightforward, unbiased. B, is by far a better choice than A. C, the author provides a more even-handed account of the places Ibn Battuta visited than of the people he met. So he's being more fair to the places than he is to the people. That's a criticism, that's a negative. So C would not be as good an answer as B. D, the account is somewhat subjective with the author clearly overstating the significance of Ibn Battuta's writings. Again, a negative criticism, subjective, overstating. So D is also not a good choice. B would be the right choice. Okay. And let's look at the final type of question in this category. Which of the following details from the passage best supports the author's assertion? And then they'll put something in quotes, something that the writer actually said, very often something from the first paragraph, which is where the thesis occurs. So they're asking you to evaluate the arguments presented in favor of the author's uh, thesis and decide which of them is the strongest. So what should you look for? First of all, something, of course, that's logical, something that is persuasive to you. There's a few specific kinds of evidence that you want to look for. The first is personal testimony. That is someone who um, is a real person who's actually on the ground, present during the event that saw it. Think in terms of an eyewitness. That is always stronger than someone who's speaking from secondhand knowledge or someone who's just quoting statistics about something. So that's something to look for. The second thing is the author's last argument. When you're making um, an argument, you have several of them, and you think about the order in which to present them, very often your best strategy is to save your strongest argument for the end. And so look at the paragraph leading up to the conclusion. That may very well continue the argument that would be the best choice for supporting the author's uh, thesis or assertion. 